for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How many of you are not from DSI? I see some faces. Great. So just to put this in context, this is our Wednesday night lecture. Every week we have, uh, hey guys. <laughs> Every week we have um, a speaker from, with a different background and a different point of view come and speak to our students. And we're really uh, delighted and honored to have Ken Fries, who teaches at Goddard. <laughs> And Kenny's going to start off by reading us the prologue of his book. This is, this is when my age shows. I have to put on my reading glasses, which means I won't be able to see you. So wait for her to settle down. Okay. If ever I needed the presence of the gods, now is the time. I arrive at Izumu Taisha, the second most sacred shrine in Japan, in early October. According to legend, the sun goddess Amaterasu built the original shrine. In every other part of Japan, the tenth month of the year is known as Kanazuki, the month without gods, because every October, all eight million Shinto deities visit Izumu Taisha for Kanari Matsuri, the gods are now in residence. I stand under the graceful wooden torii marking the entrance to the shrine's forested grounds. Then with my cane, maneuver down the Seiko no, no Baba, an avenue of gnarled pines leading to the shrine's central compound. I look up. Hanging over the entrance to the Oracle Hall is the giant Shimanawa, a traditional twist of short straw rope. The sculpture of straw is immense, five thick twists clinging with the assistance of six roped rings to a large wooden rod the same color as a straw, which itself is attached to four thinner roped rings to a dark brown wooden beam. Descending from the three largest twists are three cone-shaped bells. I reach for one of the twists and ring the bell. Ringing the shrine bell announces a visitor's presence to the resident deity. The gods now know I am here. Ever since my doctor told me what I did not want to hear, all I can think is, I don't want to die. I pull the rope and ring the bell again, this time louder, the echo reaching toward the Honden, the inner shrine, directly behind the oracle hall. I follow the sound of bronze reverberating through the air until it dissipates in front of a steep covered wooden staircase leading into the Honden. The present structure with its projecting gray wooden rafters shooting out of the roof is in its 25th incarnation. Only half as high as its pre-Buddhist original, at 24 meters it is still the country's tallest shrine. Entrance into the Honden is allowed only during special ceremonies. Lafcadio Hearn, one of the first expatriate writers to live in Japan, lived only 33 kilometers away in Matsue. He was the first foreigner granted the privilege to enter the Honden. I peer through the eight-legged east gate, decorated with unpainted wooden carvings and bouquets of gohei, lightning-shaped white paper hung at Shinto shrines to ward off evil spirits, and look into the Holy of Holies Hall, where only the head priest can go. I reach in my pocket for a particular coin. Two months ago, I found a penny in the hospital room where the man in the bed next to me died. Coins have taken on a larger meaning. I close my eyes and pray for what I know might be possible, to see the best way through this, to find a way to live with the ever-present knowledge of death as my constant companion. I bow and clap and throw the coin into the offering box. I hear the coin rattle to the bottom of the box. My prayers are urgent. The coin at the bottom of the wooden box could be my soul. I think how I first came to Japan to study the lives of disabled people in Japan. Ian was supposed to accompany me, 
But by the time I arrived in Japan, the circumstances had changed. During my first stay in Japan, my research proved fitful, difficult. Instead, single for the first time in 18 years, I discovered not only things about this foreign culture, but also new ways to see my different body and myself. Now, on my second visit, circumstances have changed yet again. I came very close to not returning at all. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I first arrived in Japan, I had no idea I would be going halfway around the world alone. Thank you. At what point in the writing of the book did you write the prologue? <laughs> the prologue, um, if you read the book, the prologue comes uh, it, uh, chronologically at the beginning of the third part of the book. And uh, actually when it came out as an excerpt on LitHub a few weeks ago, it was back in that place. Um, but I needed to find a way to, I mean, I had a dilemma. Uh, I had a book of the first 100 pages that didn't really have a through line, it didn't have a narrative. And I needed to find a way to make some, have put tension into the book. So I realized, oh, if I took that part from the beginning of the third part and put it up front, it would frame the book with the themes that I wanted it to, to do. So, yeah. And it did? It did, yeah. Now, I'm going to yeah. turn the tables on you. For, um, for anybody who doesn't know, Kenny was my teacher. He was my advisor. <laughs> so I get to ask him questions. <laughs> uh, for anyone who is still, ha still, ha still has the book ahead of them, can you just give us a context of what's the situation and what's the story? <laughs> and they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do, okay. Um, she's referencing, should I tell them what you're referencing? Sure. She's referencing, uh, Cheryl's referencing um, uh, Vivian Gornick's uh, book, The Situation and the Story, which is a very good craft book on writing a uh, personal essay and memoir. <laughs> And in that book, she talks about the difference between the situation and the story. And the idea is that um, uh, a memoirist will want to find the story in a situation. So my, the situation of the book is probably my going to Japan to, to, uh, to research disability. The story um, is probably about how a different culture um, teaches me about mortality and impermanence. How's that? That's good. Okay. <laughs> and um, Lofkari O'Hearn, how, how did you find him? Did you, had you been studying him before? No. You went? Um, I found him through Donald Ritchie, um, who was an expat writer who came to Japan um, and, uh, right after the war, uh, you know, the World War II. I don't know what the war means to you guys. <laughs> and um, so, and, uh, Reading Richie, he introduced me to Lafcadio Hearn. And uh, I use Hearn in the book to kind of, um, I know I just wrote a piece that was on Granta about, about Hearn. He's, he, uh, he became this kind of spiritual guide and he also became kind of a character in the book. So that's why, that's why I found out about him. And there were some odd uh, coincidences, but the whole thing about Japan was one coincidence after another. So after, you know, coincidence, 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 I think doesn't equal to a coincidence. It equals to, I don't know, plan. But it's interesting because when I, I did a little um, research on her and, and ghost stories were one of the things that he yes. was known for. Was yes. that part of what attracted you? No, um, what attracted to me was his, was his writing. He was one of the first uh, expatriate writers to write about Japan and to brought Japan to understanding of Japan to the West. Right. So, but um, there's a character in my book who's called M.M., who is a very well-known simultaneous, was, because he's now dead. Uh, he was a, he's a, was a very famous simultaneous interpreter in Japan. So when a visiting dignitary like a president or a secretary of state came, he was the one that, uh, that did the interpretation. And he gave me a copy early on when I befriended him, um, gave me a copy of Kwaidan, which is his, his most famous, which is Lafcadio O'Hearn's most famous book of, of, of ghost stories. So, um, 
but I didn't, what I didn't know at the time, it took me a while to realize, is that, that Hearn had a disability. He had only the use of one eye. He was in a childhood fight. So that also became, he was also the same age, kind of. He was like, I think he was turning 40 when he came to Japan for the first time when I was 41. So there was all these little similarities that I found. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it worked beautifully to follow him a little bit. Um, you say, this really struck me, the foundations of my identity, being gay, being Jewish, being disabled, were set in motion at birth. And you don't say being a writer. Right? Is that, but because, I mean, that, I think that's how so many people know you, right? Is that you not consider that part of your identity? I never think of being a writer as, my, as an identity for some reason. Um, I think of it... Say more about that, Ken. I think it, yeah. <laughs> I think of it more as a, voca as a vocation than an identity. Um, I guess when I think of identities, I think of... <laughs> I, won't even, I won't even go where I was going to go with that one. Um, uh, I, I was going to say when I think of identity, I think of oppression. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, think of, um, I think of an identity as a group, as a, as a group that you identify with. And now I'm thinking, okay, I don't identify with writers. Um, but I, I, I do. What? I know you do. I do, but I don't, I don't see it as the same thing. I mean, it's not like writers don't have a, well, I guess they do. They, they have an advocacy group and whatever, but they're, they're not fighting for civil rights. They're fighting for civil rights of other groups that they belong in. So I don't, yeah, I've never thought of that before. I don't really think of my, I don't think of it as an identity. Yeah. Maybe we have to bring that into the, you know, I don't know, in Berlin, where I, I live in Berlin is, you know, intersectionality is the rage, you know, it's, um, and I never heard of the word until I, you know, went to Berlin. I also never heard of the term critical whiteness. I thought they were joking. So now um, that you brought them up, you should explain what they are. Okay. Um, what did I bring up? Um, intersectionality. Intersectionality is, is basically. Um, we know angry white people. Right. That's so pretty much the same thing. Um, is intersectionality is when you're you have more than one identity. So I'm, I'm you know gay, disabled, and Jewish, and now I've been given the writer identity. Um, should have had that a few weeks ago. I could have done a piece for the Jewish Book Council on that. Um, and so uh, critical whiteness. Um, it's a good question. I thought they were joking when my friends told me this. Um, th it's basically the, a look at, at whiteness um, as, a <laughs> as, a as, an, as a social problem, <laughs> as an oppressive regime. Um, and uh, I hang out with a lot of radical leftists in Berlin. And they, you know, we had a lot of dinner parties when we first came there. And my husband looked at me one night after we went left and said, I always thought I was really liberal until we met these people. I feel like a Republican <laughs> compared to them. <laughs> Um, and uh, I really didn't believe it when they, my two friends, Uta and Constanza, mentioned critical whiteness. I came home and I said to Mike, they're joking. They must be. There's a thing called, and I said, I don't believe this exists. And then we went to a museum. It was an ethnological museum. We were in the bookstore, and there was a book called Critical Whiteness. And I said, oh, Lord. Um, so, but it's, it's um, Claudia Rankin is using her Guggenheim, uh, not Guggenheim, her, her um, MacArthur money to start a, I forget what exactly she's calling it, Institute of something or other. Um, so they, and she's looking at whiteness. And she, do you know people who know, do you know who Claudia Rankin is? She's some an, yeah, so, we read some of her work okay, yeah, she's an African American poet, writer, and she, um, and she's using, she started this institute to look at whiteness, and people thought that was kind of weird. Why are you doing that? And she written very beautifully about it, how you, you need to understand, you know, whiteness and this like, whole idea of whiteness before you can really understand, you know, because, you know, you know, white people, what did you say earlier? White people are the problem, or what did you say? As a, white people is a social problem. As a social problem, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, can you talk about um, the social model of disability? And yeah. what do you mean by that? Yeah. Did you invent that? No. Okay. Not at all. Um, okay. Um, disability 101 in three seconds. Uh, throughout history, basically, uh, the models that disability has been looked at were the religious model where the disabled person is looked on as e totally evil or totally saintly, so totally bad or totally good, right? And we all know that that doesn't exist. Nobody's totally good or totally bad, except maybe someone with orange hair, right? So, um, 
so that, and then as time went on, there was, then we moved into the medical model, where basically the, the idea of disability is defined by how much a body can do and can't do. It has a lot to do with industrialization and uh, things like that. And basically, the idea behind the medical model is you either kill it or cure it. You eradicate the disability so it doesn't exist. And then along came the social model, which was, um, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, thought about mostly in, in the UK. And it basically takes the, the disabling agent in this model is not the impairment, it's not the physical impairment, it's the environment, it's the, it's the society, the barriers that are put in the way, whether they're physical barriers or attitudinal barriers. So that's what the social model is. And there's been critiques of the social model as well. And there's been some newer models that people have been, this cultural model with a, a German disability studies professor has, has started to talk about, which to me is just the social model. Um, she's just making a very silly difference. And, um, and then now there's like this human rights model that's coming out of the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled per Persons, which the, U the United States is not signed on to. Mm. Yeah. And what, how is that different? Uh, what, is, what would Theresa say with the human rights? It's basically looking at the right, it's basically the rights of, it looks through a civil rights perspective, or well, human rights perspective. So, and it deals with a lot with, um, a lot with the developmental disabilities, more than like when, how does a, a person who doesn't have cognizance of certain things, how are they perceived as a, as a human, basically. Um, I don't know that model. I don't know those other models as well. Um, I end with the social model because I think it's the bee's knees or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. yeah. And you, you, you've taught disability studies. I mean, you are as known for that, right? <laughs> oh God, I'm not a scholar. This is my usual thing. I always say I'm not a scholar. I'm a creative writer, um, but. I've known the leading lights of disability studies for decades, and uh, I've, I mean, I use what I've learned, but I wouldn't call myself, I mean, I'm, yes, I've taught disability studies, um, but I've mostly taught disability representation in, in the arts. Uh, that's where I, that's my interest. Um, and I, I, I have, I taught a class, I co-taught a class in Berlin um, what was it called? What did we call it? Uh, disability, uh, the disability perspective on disability, North Europe and North, North America or something like that. But um, when I was living in Canada, um, I taught at the uh, Ontario College of Art and Design, OCAD, and um, I was supposedly was told it was the only class of its kind in an art school in all of, in all of Canada. Uh, it was called, it was called uh, Extraordinary Bodies, which I took from, from Rosemary Garland Thompson's book. So yeah, so I've taught it, um, but I don't consider myself a scholar. I, I'm, I just consider myself a creative writer, and, um, and there's, a, there's a difference. Um, there's this whole thing going on in Germany where they want to view disability studies as a science, and I just think that's ridiculous. Um, but, uh, you know, no. Do you consider yourself an activist? Um, well, for a while ago, and I didn't. By the way, if you're bored with these questions, you can just answer the ones you want. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm used to that. That's what I did with Glenn Beck. So. Um, <laughs> okay. Does everybody know that Kenny I was, was interviewed by Glenn Beck? Yeah, it was kind of an interesting. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't listen before you came. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, what was the question? Uh, it was about... Whether you consider yourself an activist. Activist. Um, it goes back to my identity as a writer. Um, I'm, I'm having another, another uh, identity crisis. Um, I consider myself an activist, but I'm not somebody who believes in or does things like write letters and have protest signs and go to large gatherings, uh, that sort of thing. But you write. I write and I also walk down the street. Um, there's the interview that a friend of mine did with me in Germany uh, called a walking political statement. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, you, I just my body in places that usually don't encounter my body. It's, it's, I feel that that's, <laughs> that's a political statement. Um, so that's the kind of, if, if, if we can define activism that way, that's, that's my activism. Yeah. And who, who do you, because we, we talk so much about the echo chamber and how we mm -hmm. all um, sort of 
hidden ourselves in an echo chamber listening to only the news we want to hear. Who do you hope reads the book? Because it has a very natural audience. It does? <laughs> Tell that to the publisher. Um, who's, who do, who's, the, who's, the nat what's the, who's the natural audience? All right. Let's have answers. Who do you think the natural audience for Kenny's book is? See? Mm -hmm. I would say um, the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Yeah? One of the disability rights are access. Mm hmm Yeah? Mm hmm See, already we, we've, we've made niche. This is why publishers can't deal with my work, because it's all, it has to be one thing. Um, I'll tell you a story. Good. Uh, when my first book, Body Remember, came out, some radio host, I can't remember who it was, it wasn't Glenn Beck, um, <laughs> uh, asked me why would somebody who's not gay, disabled, or Jewish want to read this book? <laughs> she laid down the gauntlet and, and I had an answer for her. I said the book is about the body and its relationship to memory. I said we all have bodies, we all remember. It's for everyone. <laughs> so, um, Though I, I, though I think that my, you know, you, you don't want to ignore the niche market, you know, which you do. This, this is all the United States. You don't do this a lot in other countries. Um, you surely don't do it in Japan because there's not. It's a, it's too homogenous to do that. So, um, so my book is looked at. My book is, oh, he's gay. He's disabled. He's Jewish. He's a writer. Um, he's an activist. <laughs> he's, a, he's a disability studies person. Um, what we can't, we don't know what to do with this book. Where is it going to go? Where does it fit on the shelf? Um, my joke, but it's not really a joke, um, is that if I was a white guy who went to, a white straight guy who went to Japan um, with cancer, the book would be considered universal. <laughs> um, and the, these questions wouldn't, that wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, you know, who's going to read the book wouldn't, wouldn't be an issue. Well, I, and I, I didn't mean that to bring No, I know that. Yeah. Un uncomfortable conversations with your publicist, but um, yeah. you said in the book that one of the things you wanted to do was give people in Japan a different understanding, or, or to to tell that story for people in Japan about otherness. That. You did somewhere in the book. I couldn't find it now. Yeah. And so, related a little bit to the activist question, mm -hmm. you know, do you hope this book reaches people with a message, and what? What the message would be? I won't tell the story. The first thing you said to me about audiences. What did I say? I don't remember anything I say. I don't remember anything I write. So, <laughs> um, what did I say? No, I'm interested. <laughs> you, this was the very first conversation we had, and you said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, I want to write a book, but I don't know about what, and I haven't even thought about the audience." And you said, "Fuck the audience." Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I said that. Um, <laughs> But I said it in a different I said, context is everything, <laughs> right? Uh, I think I set out to, I don't know. I don't even know why, what I set out to write, to be honest with you. I, I, I mean, I went to Japan because I, I didn't know anything about Japan. You see, you didn't, see, Cheryl didn't ask me the question I've been asked constantly about this book, is why Japan? And it's always a very strange answer. I was telling Jan, I was telling her in the, in the street corner today. Um, I mean, I, I went to Japan because I was having some physical, I was having mobility issues. And I thought, you know, I want to live abroad again. And I don't know how much longer I can do this. So I applied for every grant I could think of to go abroad. I got the one to go to Japan. Um, and so I was very interested. I did want to see what, I mean, I, you know, I get interested in things. And I was interested in what, a disabled life would be in Japan, but then I realized, this, and as I say in the book, I also was asked constantly by Japanese people and Japanese audiences, what is it like to be disabled in Japan? And they're asking me. I mean, I'm not Japanese, so being Japanese with a disability in Japan was, is completely different than being me, you know, being this, this foreigner with my particular disability in Japan, uh, which is what I always said. So. Um, I was very surprised, uh, as I said in the, the prologue, uh, the first time, the first time I was there, I 
the research was very difficult. I couldn't really find much. And, but when I went back through people that I met, I started to real, I learned a lot. So, um, so what, what do I want to say? What's my audience? Um, I don't know, I still don't know. Um, my, my, my agent just asked me about this with my next book. And I don't know, I mean, I can come up with silly answers like NPR listeners. Um, but I think anyone who's alive is my audience. Um, how does that sound? Um, so, and, I, and, and I'll even go further, hey, people that aren't alive, because I think I write for posterity, you know. Um, uh, not on the what? Not on the back end, but the front end. The front end, end. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Your children. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, it's interesting to think about, because I don't really, and these are things I guess I should know, but I don't know. Um, I really don't know who my audience is. Uh, you know, everyone who reads my book is my audience, right? This is your audience, yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm, people don't know. I'm, I'm, this is the, my first event on a 15-city book tour. So, like, you know, you get me first. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, fresh. I'm very fresh. Well, and jet-lagged, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going back to craft for a moment, because we talk a lot in the program about critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And the faculty get together and talk about how difficult it is to teach critical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a description of the garden of a garden, and you talk about mono no, 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 aware, yeah. aware, yeah. and the tapius like patterns on a wall, and it's a really beautiful metaphor for to, you know the whole not being able to see everything at once. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about? The difference between being there and seeing it and then realizing the role it was going to play in the book? Probably. Um, uh, what Cheryl's referencing is um, specifically uh, there's a garden in Kyoto Ryonji, which is a, one of the most famous Japanese gardens. It's a rock garden, and it's 16. I'm going to get it with six, I think it's 16. I have to look in the book of poems. We have uh, some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's 16 stones. You can't see them all at the same time. Um, and uh, Manono Rari is a Japanese um, idea that, um, I'll get this wrong because I'm tired. Um, it's actually, it's better to just go right here to the book and tell you what it is. Um, but of course, it's never at the beginning. Where is it? It's, uh, it's on page 49 here. Page 49, OK. And if I take this off, I could see it. Um, the definition isn't, though. Ah, here it is. Um, here it is on 48. OK, so um, to noted translator Sam, Sam Hamill, Mano no Wari is a resonance found in nature, resonance found in nature a natural poignancy in the beauty of temporal things. Owari originally meant simply emotion initiated by the engagement of the senses. Ivan Morris, in his study of the tale of Genji, says Owari refers to the emotional quality inherent in objects, people, nature, and a person's internal response to emotional aspects of the, in of the external world. Donald Ritchie writes, the awareness is highly self-conscious and what moves me is, in part, the awareness of being moved and the mundane quality of the things doing the moving. You can, do, you can get a degree in that, right? Um, so do you get it? It's, Jap Japanese things are very hard to pin down. That's what's so wonderful about them, um, kind of like the garden itself. Um, so it's basically, you know, you see something you know, let's take something kind of cliched, um, which I do, I talk about in the book, the cherry, the cherry blossoms, you know, the sakura, the, which the whole nation goes absolutely crazy for. But not only for that, they go crazy for every flower. There's a flower every month, it seems. And so what are we reacting to? We're, we, we're, what are we looking at? We're looking at, a, at an object, but we're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, they're an emotion that's being evoked in us. And so where does that, what does that come from? You know, so if you look at what, here, so we're getting into critical thinking, right? Um, but but it's, in a way, Manonari isn't critical thinking because it's just basically receiving. 
Um, but then, you know, Donald Richie. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, um, you know, but you look at those, so what are you looking at? You're looking at this color, you're looking at the, the blossom, they're falling. So a blossom that falls, what is that? It's, it's you know, impermanence, mortality, life cycles. So it's, it, it's just evoked by, a, by, a, by an object. And it's what it, it evokes in you. And that's, I mean, that's really what this book is. It's what Japan did evoke in me. Um, so yeah, uh, does that answer your question? Not really, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you talk about the stories that people tell and how they represent one. When I met you, you were moving from Toronto to Berlin to write a completely different story. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? What you're researching, where that stands? Not to pressure you, but how that book is coming along? <laughs> um, everyone know I had a piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago? Because that's related to that research. Uh, yeah, I went, but see, this is what's so odd about me, is that I go where my life, where I want to go. We'll be the judge of it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I go where I want to go, and then I find a reason to go. Uh -huh. um, same thing with Japan. I mean, if you would have told me I went, would have went to Japan 15 years ago and I'd be sitting here talking to you about a book I made in Japan, I would have laughed. I was in Berlin in 2010 for my 50th birthday year. I traveled all over the place. And Mike and I went to Vienna. We met a, f a, a friend of mine who was on a Fulbright in Poland, and she came to Berlin. And Mike and I looked at each other and said, hmm, how are we going to live here? <laughs> Took me a little bit, but three years later, I came up with a, a project that I knew I thought could get funding, and it was to look at the lives of disabled people who grew up in what was East Germany, the GDR. So, I, and I did get two grants to go, um, and so we went, and it was only for four months, and then we realized, oh, we really like it here, so uh, we, we so we basically eventually moved there. But what happened in the meantime was I did do this research. Sometimes I actually do what I set out to do. And, um, but when I, very early on in that research, I realized that I could not understand anything about disability in Germany unless I went back further, mostly to the Nazi period and Action T4, the, the, the Nazi program to kill disabled people. And then I realized I had to even go back further because things happened in the 20s and before then to disabled people. So I landed up. Um, you know, writing about killing disabled people. Uh, that's that, so I mean, it's the euphemism. I mean, that's, I'm writing a book called Stumbling Over History, which is about, um, again, it's taking disability and moving it in the center. Most people see it on the margins, but to me, it's, it's the center. It's, it's, it's been there since the beginning of my life. So um, I move, you can't, the, the, I found out the connections between Action T4 and killing disabled people and the Holocaust and the killing of the Jews. Um, and I'm, I'm also Jewish, so, you know, and so uh, that's what I'm writing. Um, the book is, uh, I've gotten a lot of grant money. It's totally researched by now. Uh, there's very little of it written. I have a proposal that hasn't gone anywhere um, yet. Um, and, but maybe now with the Times article, we'll see if that changes anything. Uh, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm ostensibly doing. I spent the last few years, there's six, T4 killing sites, and I went to all of them. Fun, right? Um, and I, I never knew what to, I don't know what to say about these things because it's like I, you know, I'm going to I'm going to Hadamar where you know 10,000 disabled people were killed. Am I excited? <laughs> I mean, if somebody asked me when I finished the all six, like, so how does it feel? It's a strange thing. And there's no words to describe this sort of stuff. And you had a story about being in an elevator. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give away the next book. Oh, uh, yeah. I, um, I got, uh, going down to see my first gas chamber, I got stuck in the elevator. So yeah, so talk about, you know, I mean, I'm given these things, you know. And I was in, yeah, so, yeah, you know, so that was one of the exciting things that happened. Um, so yeah, I made it to all six places, uh, five in Germany, one in, in Austria. And uh, I have all the material, it's now, it's now getting to getting enough money so I could take a leave and not teach and, and write the book. And I've, I've had a very strange thing in my life. I've never been able to write a first draft of a book in my house and at home. I would always go to writers. I'd go away for residencies like you're going to go to Bellagio. So I, I, 
and I said, okay, we have to stop doing this. We have to, but I, can't, I don't think, I don't know if I can write a first draft at home. It's just I can't get into that space that I need to get into with uh, having to feed myself and you know, my husband coming into the room asking me if I you know, need lunch or whatever. I just, you know, I thought I could, but I, I have like 25 pages. I have, a, I have the whole book sketched out. I have a whole you know, 65 page proposal. Um, we will open it up for questions from the class, but uh, if you had the interviewer of your dreams, is there something you wish I had asked, or is there something you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm still thinking about writing as an, writing as a, as a identity. That's going to be the <laughs> takeaway from this whole thing. I'm going to bring that up at every stop along the tour. Yeah. yeah. Do you think of writing as an, as, as an identity? Well, mm, no. No, but I'm, I haven't published books, and I'm not doing a book okay, ask, and uh, I don't make my living teaching writing. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons. I'll ask, I, but I have, do, you, do, you, do, you feel, do, you, do you find teacher, a teacher as your, as your, as, as your identity? De depends on who I'm talking to, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. It's interesting, I never thought about that. Do people. you have any thoughts on, because you know enough about this program, uh, and you know that everyone here is interested in social justice and equity and environmental issues. Do you, what do you think they ought to take away, or what do you hope they see in the book? I don't know, they have to tell me that. All right, then we can ask them. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you, yes, talk about it. Um, in one of the first year classes, we have to do daily journals as part of the personal transformation class. Um, so I just wondered, I wanted to talk more about the role of writing in your process of self-discovery. I am the worst model, role model, for anything that has to do with writing. <laughs> um, I always, did I ever tell you that? Yes. Yeah, I did, okay. Um, because I don't write very much. <laughs> um, I'm not a daily writer. I stay with a, I stay with a very uh, well-known writer friend, Joan Silber, here, and she writes every day, and I said, how interesting. <laughs> um, uh, I just could never do that. Um, I've written a lot over the last few months, because to for, well, ostensibly for publicity purposes, you know, to get things out there and stuff. So it's been very interesting to do that. Um, it's interesting you talk about journals because um, I should have brought you my journal. Um, there's nothing in it. Um, I basically, I mean, my Japan, my journal from Japan, I mean, I basically, a lot of quotes. Um, uh, they're not kind of diary type things, like things that I've done. Um, sometimes I try to go back and think, oh, I must have written about that, you know, so I can get some information. No, it's not there. <laughs> um, however, if you really want to do something interesting with your life, um, my, journals, my journals from when I was younger, my literary archive was, was acquired by the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley. And um, I had to inventory it, you know, before I, you know, b when I was leaving, when I was leaving, moving to, uh, to Berlin, I thought, you know, I've been carrying these 30 boxes with me forever. I don't want them anymore, and I really want to sell them and get them out of my life. And lo and behold, uh, a few months later, that happened. So, um, but I looked at these journals from when I was younger. Oh, God, it's really frightening. Um, one was called The Book of Pain. I called one, you're going to love this, Cheryl. Um, one I dedicated to all my friends that I love, all the people I hate, all the people. <laughs> it was really weird. Which list was longer? Um, they were all together. Ah. It was like just the, you know, that's, it was very strange. So my, my, process, is very, my process is very, very odd. Um, I, get, I get an idea, I get an image, I, get a, I usually get a sentence. And I know if I have a sentence and I have a beginning, I could, I could, I have a book. Sounds weird, right? But that's what happens. And so, sometimes they take years. My books take 10 years. And I vow the next one won't, but you know, in 10 years, you can call me up and see if it's done. Um, uh, so, so my process is very strange, because it takes me a while to, to, to write, a very, I write a first draft, and it's a mess. 
and I have no idea what it is. And I've been saying this, so it must be true, because I say it. I didn't know what I had. My, in the province of the gods went through 27 drafts. And I didn't know what the book was about until like draft 23. Um, so I don't know if this is answering your question. But um, I don't journal. I don't um, do that sort of thing. But things stick around. I was asked for some poems. And I don't really write poems anymore. And I, when I was in Japan in 2005, I wrote three haiku, but I was never happy with the third one. We're talking haiku. We're talking, you know, three. You know, that's, that's my poetic output over the last 12 years. And, um, but I, I, I finally finished this third haiku over the last few weeks because somebody wanted it by a deadline. Um, you know, but it was sitting, it sat, with, sat there for, for 12 years. Um, so did that, that, did that help at all? Probably not, but you know. Um, yeah? I want, who, who makes you do this journal? That's what, that's what I want to know. It's not you, is it? No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I have six questions, but I'm going to make you one sentence. Are you feeling comfortable sitting in a chair? Ha! Huh. I'm never comfortable sitting in a chair. Um, I mean, I'm more comfortable sitting in a chair than I am standing. Um, uh, this is, we should have done that for your design for good class last year. Taya is a furniture designer. Oh, okay. I, 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 want, I, 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 want my, I want my feet to be on the ground. It's, very, it's rare that that happens. There, yeah. Are you going to build me that chair? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Are you, are you, uh, you mentioned about the social model and the cultural model. What are the differences? Yeah. yeah, I don't think there is a difference, but, but Anna Waldschmidt at the University of Cologne does. So you'd have to ask her, uh, because when she explained it to me, I said, that's a social model. Um, you know, it basically it's like, um, OK, what she pointed out to me when I was in her office um, was, Look where the disabled entrance to the building is. You have to go. It's like where the garbage is. That's the cultural model. You know what does what does it what does it tell you where something is? You know, um, it's very interesting. You know, when I went to Japan, I realized that all the ways I describe disability here, I couldn't talk about. I would talk about here. I would say, how would you feel about a building where African Americans can't get into? Right. <laughs> People there look at me like, what? Because it's a homogeneous, it's, it's such a more homogeneous society. So there I realized very quickly that I had to talk about the elderly, because it's a, it's a very elderly society. And so I could talk about access that, that way. But you have four more questions. <laughs> uh, do they have a common goal? Like a common ground? Like how do you see, I mean, for example, like how do you think as a, looking at your perspective to other people using the object or furniture or spaces, how do you see if there is a common goal with the social model and cultural model from Japan to America? Because like in here they have they have more access for the disability people like using like object or furniture or something like that, but in Asia or in Africa they may be like a those objects yeah. Um, it's, you know, but you have to, we have to be careful when we make generalities because so much is about context. I felt everything was so much more accessible to me because I had an apartment where I could reach everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just like, a, I just fit, literally, I fit mm -hmm. there. Um, the other thing is there's, some, there's, a, there's an organization you might be interested in called um, Whirlwind. It's out of San Francisco State. Um, university, they build wheelchairs for uh, uh, one developing countries or whatever you want to call them. Um, and uh, they basically use a lot of spare parts of wheelchairs that we think are old and not useful. But on the terrains in Africa, for instance, uh, they're much, they're useful. And they put together these things. He, Ralph Hotchkiss is in charge of it. He won a, a, a MacArthur many, 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 many years ago. Um, so I don't think that, I don't know, so I'm not quite sure what you mean by common ground. Um, 
but I think that the thing to really think of, and this I learned through my Darwin research from my last book, it's, it's context is all. Because we all know the, the phrase survival of the fittest, right? But it's not the phrase. It's, people forget that the whole phrase is, is the survival of the fittest in a particular environment. So it's really about the particular environment that you're in. Um, for, I mean, the example I always give is, OK, here I don't see any visibly disabled people. If I'm mistaken, I'm sorry, but I don't see it, right? Um, there might be people with invisible disabilities. So I'm probably the most disabled person here. But there's lots of times when I'm with um, people and that I'm the most able person. I still won't move chairs. But um, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, especially ones that I can't put my feet on the ground. Um, so uh, that's, um, you know, so it's, it's all about context. And we, for, we, forget, we forget that. Um, so yeah, now you still have, you've got a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's usually not at a loss for words. <laughs> Do you have any, like, uh, dream, like, how those kind of furniture or objects can impact your life better? Do you think, like, not for when you also for the... Yeah. I think, I think it's the understanding of objects that I'm more interested in. There's a chapter in, there's a chapter in the history of my shoes and the evolution of Darwin's theory, which you should look at, um, because it's uh, when I, I took a, I, took, I did something really nuts. I drafted down the Grand Canyon with 15 disabled people, not only disabled, they were also guides and people to help and stuff, uh, and that's in ca that's that's part of that book. And what I realized in that book is that. Um, the things that we look at as adaptations um, for people with dis disabilities are, they're really no different than anything else. Everything we use is an adaptation. A chair is an adaptation. A refrigerator is an adaptation. Um, this comes from, there's a, you know, the, what's the old adage? I don't even know, I, I've claimed it, but it's not mine. Somebody else must have said it. Um, who says that riding a motorcycle is cool and riding in a wheelchair isn't? It's just, it's arbitrary. So I realized on this trip down the Grand Canyon because there were, certain, there were certain things that were used to make the trip easier for the disabled people. Funny, funny, interesting, not, they were not intentionally for disabled people, they were adapted for that use. And there were these porta floors, for instance, that um, were used, and we had wheelchair users, so we would camp on the sandy beaches along the Colorado, right? So you put them down and you could have mobile thing. I assumed, oh, how neat, they developed this just for this. Eh, wrong. I talked to the guy who was in charge of the thing. He was at a party, and you know when you go to, I don't know, you go to a wedding and it's in a tent somewhere, and they have these porta floors because it makes it, yeah. yeah, and whatever it is. So he saw them and he said, oh, I could use these to make my, my trips accessible to disabled people. Um, it's all about adaptation. We, the things we take for granted, you know, everything we look at, you know, and I realized on that trip, the boats were adaptation, right? Boats don't just happen. Uh, we make them. And so, but because everybody who's considered normal, but there is no normal, uses them, it's not thought of as an adaptation. But all furniture is an adaptation, right? So, um, so it's, it's all, again, it's, a, it's about context. So my dream is that people realize that it's the context that matters. It's not that disability isn't a fixed category. Um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a continuum which then leads me back to in the province of the gods where I learned that you know, life is a continuum. Uh, there's no before, there's no after. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Did you have six? Was that all six? No. no. <laughs> I, 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 I hate saying people about disabled, they disabled people. I want to say this ability. And this ability. Is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so in your book, it's very prominent that you found uh, the representation of disabilities in the Japanese culture through gods and ladies and heroes. So after that, that experience, uh, what is your vision on the representation of? Disabilities in the Western culture. How do you compare it? Um, I th what's really interesting to me was that I found some of the same 
uh, tropes and stereotypes in the literature that are in the West, which I thought was interesting, especially amongst blindness. Um, if we go back to the Greeks and Oedipus, um, you know, uh, blindness is always um, a metaphor for knowledge in, in Western literature. And I found the same thing in, in Japanese literature, which was very interesting. The blind prophet is just all over the place. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I think it's the same situation here, is that you know, disability is, I will make the claim that disability should be put at the front and center of everything and we can understand the world better. There, how do you like that? Um, and that's tweetable. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> Kenny doesn't have a hashtag yet, so I think we have to set him up. I, I gave him one. Ah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Identity writer. Um, yeah, hashtag. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're never going to live this one down, Cheryl. Um, uh, so, so I, I, th I think that's the, that's the it, no matter what culture you go into, I think you're going to find that disability is there and it's very central and then for some reason, and it's your job as students and critical thinkers to find out what that reason is, it disappears. Um, and that's what, happened, that's what happens in Japan. Um, in the book, I talk brief. I, I sometimes don't know what part of the research has gotten into the book and what is not, because a lot of the research be, is not in the book. But uh, I think this is in the book. Um, the Japanese language really was, was really a, happened because of disabled people. It was the blind biwahoshi, the blind priests roaming around Japan, spreading the, the national legends and myths that spread the, the language. So the Japanese language, central to Japanese language were disabled people. If you stop somebody on the street in Tokyo and ask them, they'll look at you like you're nuts. They have no idea about this, right? Um, the the Shichifu Fukujin, the seven lucky gods, according to a disability studies professor, Hanada Shuncho, they're all disabled. And especially Ibisu, the most popular one. Um, Fascinating. Everybody, you know, you, you can see trinkets of these things all over the place. People are bringing them home, and they don't know that it's disabled. We had, you know, look, we have one of the, the the most important presidents of the United States in the 20th century was FDR, right? I always have to ask do people know who he is because a lot of people don't know him. You, you know, show? Roosevelt, and he was, I have yeah, no idea. and he. How who, many of you know who FDR? How do you know FDR? Okay, how many of you know he was disabled? Okay. Um, abroad, nobody knows, um, but very few people know even here. It's, it's, it's amazing, because he hid it. I mean, there is a reason why they don't know. But, you know, it's central. But did ever, no one, very few people look at what, what did that mean? Uh, there is a book called FDR Splendid Deception by Hugh Gregory Gallagher that talks about that. Um, and a lot of people think his, his not being able to come to terms with the disability, he was very ill when he went to Yalta, was it Yalta? And so, and so because of that, the whole post-World World War II world was developed because he was not really present enough to, to figure out what was going on. Um, so disability is, is so central to so many different things. Um, and usually, it, it, disability is seen as, as pejorative, you know, it's, it's, it's as a negative. And, but if you start to look through the history, you see that it's, it, it doesn't have to be, and it's not. Um, yeah, so does that, I think, does that, you know, I don't think there's much of a difference between the, between the West and, and Japan in that, in that way. If you look at the representation of disability, it's pretty similar. Um, I think the difference is that in the United States, we have disability scholars in the, in the humanities that have been looking at this for a while. But there's people, I mean, I asked a woman about, a graduate student about disability. She was a manga. She was really into manga. And she sent me a lot of stuff, dis, you, know, dis, people, dis, you know, disability in manga. You know, it, it's there. It's just that we don't, we don't know about it. And I think that's an, pretty much in all cultures. I said that to Glenn Beck in some way, shape, or form. Yeah? yeah? Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience um, Mm -mm. Oh, um, code switching comes from like linguistics, and social linguists found that depending on um, language that somebody spoke, if they're bilingual, their personalities change, and it's come to 
mean broad, broadly um, how there is one core self of different identities depending on the, the context and the communities that you're in. Mm -hmm. And you said that you're gay, disabled, Jewish as if it's like a seamless, organic um, thing. But I imagine that it's not. So does your gay self come up more in certain situations and your disabled self and how do you reconcile with and your writer self. <laughs> and my writer self. <laughs> Notice how teaching does not come into it. Um, I actually think it is seamless, which is interesting because I never thought that. So that's a gift you just gave me. Um, you might appear in my next book. Um, <laughs> and by then it will be mine and I'll, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Um, however, um, usually in different places, like here tonight, I'm, all, I'm, ever, I'm, I'm seamless. Uh, and I had an interesting experience in Berlin uh, two years ago. God, time is going by. Uh, there was an exhibit, there was a big exhibit, get a load of this, state-funded exhibit called Homosexualities. Impossible. I had to explain to my German friends that this is impossible in the United States. Mm -hmm. And not only that, the Deutsches Historisch Museum. So that's kind of like the Smithsonian doing it in partnership with the Schulis Museum, the Game Museum. And uh, all over town was Cassils. Do people know Cassils, the, the artist? Transgender or no gender or every gender. A picture of him, her, they, whatever. I don't, she changes what she wants to be called. Um, all over Berlin of this uh, uh, amorphous gendered, uh, uh, looks like a woman, uh, but muscles. It was just amazing, all over Berlin, right? So I was asked to, well, it wasn't as a long story, but I got to do an event for this. I got to do a reading. And the reading took place at the Schulis, at the Gay Museum, but it was on the eve of the Disability Pride Parade. And I realized it was an amazing night, one of my favorite nights of my life. And one of the reasons was because I realized that for one time in my life, I was, I was both gay and disabled <laughs> that night. It was an extraordinary thing. Um, no, it, you know, probably nobody, it didn't matter to anyone else but me. So um, there are different contexts. And the, the problem is I'm usually the only disabled person in gay environments. And a lot of the times I'm the only gay person in disabled environments. Um, Jewish just is different. I just wrote a piece, you can go, it's Jewish Book Council, it's called the Nazi Trifecta, Gay, Disabled, Jewish. Um, it was uh, <laughs> Ian, my, my ex, my, it was, that's not mine, my ex Ian, who if you read my books you get to know, uh, he, he, he's the one who termed that. And, um, and uh, the piece on the Jewish Book Council blog is called the Nazi Trifecta, and um, it's, a, it's really funny. I could, I could, it's very funny because there's a whole thing about communists in there. Um, so um, where was I going with this? This is when jet lag sets in. Um, uh, so you were talking about being yeah. So I was so yeah. So so I, there it 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 really does depend. But it's interesting because I do feel when I'm walking down the street or I'm no, let's not walking down the street when I'm lying in bed. Or I'm, 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 it's seamless. Or I don't even think about it, to be honest with you. I don't think about it. It's kind of like my age. I think about it, my age a lot, but I don't realize it. I don't realize that I'm 57. You know, I look through, you know, you know, I don't know, what do they, what do you call them? You know, the grinder and all that stuff, geodating, you know, sex sites, and, blah, blah, blah. and I see people and I say, oh, 35 my age, it's very weird. <laughs> <laughs> you have to edit this out. So, um, uh, so, yeah, so, um, so I do, I do, it's very, this is very, so now I have many gifts tonight. I have, um, I have this writing identity and now I have this, this seamless thing. <laughs> yeah. Did that answer your, did that kind of answer your question? I never really, if you notice, I don't answer direct questions. I got that from being in Japan. <laughs> Nobody ever asked. See, I'm Japanese, so I think you're kind of sort of good an answer by asking. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah. It's, it's, it's just, yeah. It's, an, it's amazing how that happens there. Yeah, back there. Journey of love, and um, <coughs> you mentioned some questions that you didn't ask yourself before, and 
that moment, like, um, I attracted to someone going to like me, or um, things like that. So I wonder, uh, being a human with a visibility, uh, and your love, your what limitations were created by yourself, and what limitations were imposed by the environment. So I have another indirect way of answering this question. Um, somebody, somebody I know uh, took photos of me 20, 20, a long time, or 27 years ago now, or 1990, early 90s. God. Um, and she asked if she could put it, she's a photographer, she asked me if she could put it on her website. And she wanted me to look at them, so I looked at them, and I got very sad when I looked at them because I saw myself at 30, and I realized how attractive I was at 30, but I didn't feel it. And so um, I wasted a lot of, we all do this, right? You could all shake your head, right? <laughs> um, we could all raise our hand. More people will know, will know this than FDR. And, um, and so, uh, but where did that come from? I'm somebody, uh, somebody who, I mean, I've, I've been single for three years in my adult life. <laughs> the, the time in Japan uh, was, was one of them. Um, and so, uh, but I, you know, I, I've, so yes, I think it all came from the outside. It had to, because I wasn't born. You know, you're not born feeling a certain way. You're getting it from the people around you or the society you live in. Um, but beyond that, I was also given something, and I don't quite know, it must have come from my parents, but I don't know for sure. You have to read Body Remember to figure that one out. Um, so you have to buy all my books. And um, it's, it's a continuum. It is, actually. And um, so um, where am I going with this? So basically, um, somewhere along the line, though, I was given a belief in myself. Uh, you know, when I get ignored by publishers or I get ignored by the press or whatever, it's never about me. It's, I know that. It's never about I'm not a good writer or I don't, you know, I'm not worth whatever. It's always the problem on the other side. Never, I've never, and I, I get that from somewhere. I, don't, I just didn't, I didn't pick it out of the air. So I, though I, I probably, you know, lived my life not feeling attractive or, or et cetera and so forth, I always, I never, I never doubt the value of the things that I've done and the things that I do. That's a lie. Because, <laughs> because I had an experience a few weeks ago um, that was very interesting. Well, interesting is the wrong word. Go back to Japan. Here we say interesting and we don't mean it. It's kind of like we mean like, you know, we don't know what else to say, we're really not. But in, when they use the word omoshiroi in, 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 in Japanese, they really mean the interesting, which I thought was interesting, right? <laughs> um, so what happened the other night? Um, have I told you I haven't slept in three weeks? I've been sleeping like four hours ever since with the New York Times. I was editing the New York Times article, which is like three weeks ago now. And one night I was up at, I don't know, two, three in the morning. Do I hear bagpipes? <laughs> um, yeah. What? There's a door situation. It also sounds like a crying baby, which... Yeah. Oh, I thought, it was bag, I thought it was bagpipes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had so moved to Brigadoon. Brigadoon, yeah. Kind of so, a stress, yeah. <laughs> so what happened, the, what happened that night is, um, okay, I have a book coming out, so I'm obsessed. I look, I look at Amazon numbers and see what, and I do this, it's, 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 it's really about trying to figure out what's working for publicity, right? That's what I say. Um, yeah, the Jewish Book Council moved things this, this week. Um, so um, I was up at night and I do these crazy things. I look up Kenny Fries in the Province of the Gods on Google to see if there's anything new. Knowing that I don't have to do this, my publicist is gonna find it and tell me in the morning, right? But I love telling, oh, I saw that already, right? So I did that, and I'm getting around to the point, trust me. Um, and so I found this article, this review written, um, it's actually in a small place, the Vermont Digger. Could you believe there's a place called the Vermont Digger? And um, it's actually gonna be, re it's actually, he's also doing it for, the, for a gay publication, so it's coming out again. 
And he, um, I had just finished my Guggenheim Fellowship application, my career narrative, and boy, I wish I had seen this review earlier. It's very small. It's like this big. And he really he gives, it's not only a review of, this, of the, the province of the gods, it's actually a, it's a, it's a mini career retrospective. And he said something about my first book and what it meant, and not meant to me, but meant to the, I guess, the, you know, the world, I don't know, literature. And he talked about what that book, that and, and staring back, the anthology that I edited the same year, the, the meaning of these things. I was totally blown away. My poor husband was fast asleep, and I, I, I do this often. I woke him up, and I, I mean, I was hysterically crying. I just, um, I was, it was like somebody reflected something that I always, already, I always knew, but it was, it, it, it put it into words. But you did that for me once. I did? Yes, in your process paper. <laughs> Oh. Yes, she did that. Yeah. yeah. She had, what? What <laughs> <laughs> uh, The student professor. Um, Cheryl, at Goddard, when you, uh, one of your graduating degree requirements is you have to write this thing called a process paper about your processing. It's, it's very lesbian. You have to like discuss everything, you know, that sort of thing. I'm being very, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's, that's, what, that's what Goddard is like. It's you're processing everything. And so you have to write this thing. And, and um, Cheryl wrote about my, you know, our relationship as teacher and, and, and you know, advisee, advisor. And um, she said something that I did. It's in the paper, right? Or am I, or yeah. It's, it's in it, the paper. It's in the paper. Uh, basically, she, I, she told me what I did as a teacher. <laughs> it was just, you know, and just reflected it back to me. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, and that's what, this, that's what this review did. So what does this have to do with your question, right? Um, so it's basically, <laughs> is, you know, there, I, there's even with the belief that I, so I have these two things going on, this, you know, we all do though, right? You know, and it's, it's a matter of, I think our personalities develop on like what percentage, you know, if you're 71% insecure and 29%, you know, not, you know, you, you come out differently, right? Um, so you basic, so I basically have these both things where I think you know I'm I you know I'm very unattractive, but yet I think I'm I'm very worthy, at the same time. So you have both of them, and as I learned in Japan, you have to hold both of them. You can't one doesn't exist without the other. You have to have them both simultaneously, um, which goes back to <laughs> the rocks and not seeing everything at the same time. See, it all come, It's all a seamless whole. See, um, so yeah. So you have a choice. We can take one more question. Mm hmm. Or you could say, I'm done. We can take one more question. <laughs> but you get to, ch I'm not going to choose who the no, last question is. Choose. No, no, no. Then I, I, I would be accused of having favorites, whereas you can't. <laughs> okay. Because while doing some research uh, for a social issue, I found that actually there are many articles addressing that issue. It seems that scholars already knew uh, what caused that problem and how to solve it, but nothing has been changed. Mm -hmm. So there is a uh, there is saying say uh, knowledge doesn't change behaviors. So I want to know what do you think about it. And, uh, how do you think about oh. <laughs> uh, it's a few things. Do you want to go for an easier question? No, it's a, <laughs> I don't know whether to be pessimist or optimistic or neither. Um, so as usual, as you've noticed, I have very strange ways of answering questions, right? Um, first thing that came to mind was something that Sarah Schulman said very early on when I knew her a long time ago, um, was that writing is like being a plumber. So it's a job. So you do it, and you still have to do the activist stuff. That's, so that's one thing. So in that sense, writing can't really... What is it? Uh, God, God, we're going back to a, something in the healing notebooks, which I wrote in 1990. How many of you were not born yet in 1990? Yeah, OK. Um, so uh, what was it? It was, it was it Auden who said, not one of my poems ever saved a Jew? 
or something? Was it a Jew or a life? I don't remember. You have to go back and read the healing notebooks. Um, so that's that thing. So no, I don't think it does make social change. But, and the other thing is that is if we're going to put it in a disability context, and I talk about this in an interview recently, I don't think the interview is out yet, or if it is, yes, I don't think it's out yet. Um, no matter what I do, and no matter how many people buy my books, we get one movie like You Before Me, Me Before, me Before You that came out last year or whatever, and it's like not even a drop. Anything, me and Ann Finger and Steve Kazis, all the disabled writers that I know, no matter what we do, it's not even a drop in the literary bucket compared to one Hollywood movie that comes out and has a, you know, just a horrible depiction of disability because millions and millions of people are going to see it. And, you know, if I'm lucky if 5,000 people are going to read what I write. However, that's the, that's the negative part of it, right? That's the pessimist coral reef. Is just, we're never going to just write the coral reef thing. Um, your last lecture, that, that Cheryl said, was a downer. Um, <laughs> so, don't, so um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't worry about the environment. Just read books. Um, so, uh, uh, so the, on the other hand, I love the noises. Um, so the, on the other hand, um, I read books some of the time. And I get sustenance from them, right? I read something, you know, I read as an undergraduate, I read Adrian Rich and changed my world. Little did I know that later in life I would meet Adrian Rich and have a correspondence with her. Um, and then she would say to me, the last words she said to me were the first words I said to her. Um, yeah, you could read that too, that's online. Uh, um, and uh, so, so is that social change? I mean, what, what causes change? It's not, you know, there's one theory that, you know, it's one person who does something and changes the course of history, but is that really the way it works? Isn't it that we have these minute changes, you know, I said, she said something to me tonight and I changed and then I said something to you and then I go to Los Angeles and I say something to them. Is that the way change happens, social change? Does social change have to be huge to have an effect? Is it enough that he builds me a chair? I, I don't know. I mean, these are, these are questions. I'm a person of questions. That's why I'm, I'm Jewish. I ask questions. I don't have answers, right? So um, that's also my first book. It's really funny when you've done as much as I do. You could refer to all these things. It's really weird. Um, I've never quite done this before. Um, so, so yes and no. I mean, what is social change? I mean, I think that's what we we talk about it. You know, what it, but what does it really mean? What does social change really mean? We talk about it like, you know, what do I tell you not to use in work? I tell my students, don't use the word pain. I mean, what, what's pain? Is this general thing? What, is, so what do you mean by social change? So maybe the answer to the, the question is, depends what you mean by social change. And could writing, you know, do that? Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know. That was actually one of your more cogent answers. Oh, okay, really? <laughs> I thought I was extremely cozy yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. If she was only my student again. <laughs> um, thank you, Kenny. That was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah.